In this video, I'm going to tell the story of how the frame of Mr. Fusion was designed and fabricated. The initial fabrication subsection of this build involved fabricating the front suspension. I was totally clueless at the beginning, but learned as it progressed and buoyed by the presence of an apparently working front suspension, me and the crew proceeded to mock up the engine and the vacuum chambers. The vacuum chambers were included simply because I'd been collecting them for years and liked the look. The challenge was to design and fabricate a functional and aesthetically pleasing frame which would utilize the vacuum chambers as structural members as well as provide support for the drivetrain, a small block Chevy from a 1992 Camaro. The small block Chevy was chosen because Chevy made 80 million of them. I figured it's so ubiquitous that if it broke down, it could throw a rock and hit a mechanic who knew how to work on it. That sort of thing was important the first few years since I didn't know jack about cars. The first order of business was to fabricate a truss which connected the Ford most vacuum chamber to the front suspension block. The initial confusion about how to deal with the pivot points of the suspension had been accomplished and now it was about structure, something which has far fewer constraints. The main reason the main truss member on the bottom dips down is it has to clear the steering rack and pinion. Luckily, the truss, while unusual, was aesthetically pleasing and the project began to gain some momentum. Here's the beginnings of the truss structure which will ultimately wrap around the engine slash transmission. The main tubes of the truss are turned into an arc utilizing a hydraulic roll bender. You can see the roll bender in the very right of this image. Here's a clip of a fairly tight bundle of half inch tube having its radius being made tighter. Here's another video of the bender in action. It's pretty obvious how it works. The video is worth 10,000 words. Here's the first half of the rear truss structure from the opposite side. Pretty obvious what's going on here. Throughout the fabrication process, pains were taken to keep both sides more or less symmetric. Mechanically, it makes everything function better, while aesthetically, there's something inherently pleasing about symmetry. For instance, the most beautiful models have nearly perfectly symmetric faces. All the vacuum chambers included in this car are mirror images of each other from left to right. This is a photo of the winner's quick change differential slash axle slash hubs, which had been salvaged off the stock car. Unfortunately, I don't have any photos of that rolling chassis. It wasn't part of the art, so it never occurred to me to document it. I'm ultra fond of how the truss terminated into the vacuum chamber. It works, but knowing what I know now, it could have been made much better. But it's not terrible, especially compared to the, the aesthetics of the traditional double ladder frame found in production vehicles. Here's the engine after having been outfitted with a nice serpentine system. At the time, I didn't have a CNC mill, so I couldn't make my own brackets. The serpentine brackets have to be fairly accurate in order for everything to function, so it's hard to use cutting and welding for the fabrication method, although it is possible. If I knew then what I know now, I would have tried something with cutting and welding. I think that if the brackets were a little off after the welding distortion, it'd be possible to get the bracket to work via cold setting. Still, it's better to machine it. It takes less time, it's more accurate, it's cleaner. Going off on a tangent, one thing that bugs me about hot rods is that they make a beautiful engine and then they hide it by stuffing it behind a radiator. It's really a shame, but I can't complain too much because I stuffed this engine behind a vacuum chamber. So dumb. The radiator ended up being mounted behind the transmission. That's not done on production cars because it wastes volume and it's less efficient since the heat from the exhaust pipes affect the rate of heat exchange in the radiator, but this is an art car and we don't care about practicality. Here's the read to the rear axle. I was quite pleased with how this turned out. In my opinion, it's sufficiently artistic. Here's Andy doing some welding on it. The purple light makes it look slightly sci-fi. This is the view from the rear. Unfortunately, the wielder of the camera didn't center the shot quite perfectly. The camera phones used in the, all the photos in this video are 2012 vintage and older, and making these videos made me realize what a tremendous difference there is between our current technology and the tech from 11 years ago. Half these images are grainy and or out of focus. This is a rendering of the CAD model. Throughout this design process, I would design a little bit of it in CAD, fabricate it, then design a little bit more. I never put it all together into a main assembly until years later. Speaking of out of focus, look at this. I'm sitting in the rear passenger side seat testing out the view. This could have been a nice photo, but alas. Here's the beginning of the top front truss. The top truss is meant to supplement the vacuum chambers below it, giving the entire structure quite a bit of depth and rigidity. As I'll describe later, it didn't fully work out as intended. Here's the front truss completed. With the bodywork attached, the outline of the vehicle is taking shape. This is when it's nearing completion, along with the front suspension. This animation shows the bevels in the tubes and how they fit together when fabricating a vacuum chamber. The welds on the vacuum chambers are tiny. They're vacuum welds, and they don't need to be larger structural welds since the vacuum force is pulling everything together. 
The vacuum welds simply have to be airtight, they can't be leaked, and they have to be able to handle only one atmospheric pressure. One atmospheric pressure is about 15 psi, that's not much. The reason I'm showing this animation is to relay the story of how the frame broke at the 2012 I was chauffeuring my friend Radnoff and a woman on a playa date. Their date, not mine. I was just the chauffeur. We were driving around looking at art. We were out past the temple in deep playa when suddenly the frame snapped. Well, it didn't snap. It broke and the top part bent and the bottom broke. The joint which failed was the one represented in the previously shown animation. The frame broke at the bottom because the vacuum chamber weld had failed. You know, it had that tiny little vacuum weld and it's just intention. It just wasn't strong. The truss bent, but it wasn't broken. Unfortunately, I don't have any photos from the side. Documenting this wasn't the first thing on my mind. Immediately after it broke. It wasn't drivable, the frame dug into the playa, and as soon as it happened, I went off in search of a welder, went to the machine shop, and I went to heavy equipment, and finally ended up locating a friend of mine from San Diego who had a welding rig on playa. His name's Lindsay, and he had this walking art car mutant vehicle out there. We drove out to my car with a truck, a generator, a welder, and a bottle jack, put the bottle jack underneath the frame, jacked it up, and luckily it just went boom, locked into place all aligned. All that needed to happen was Lindsay put a big fat mic weld over the broken vacuum weld. Afterwards, it drove just like normal. It was about four hours from the time that it to the time it was fixed. Not too bad considering that it is out in the middle of nowhere. Nevertheless, that's embarrassing. I mean, I'm embarrassed about it, but it makes a good story. I reinforced the structure the next year by adding a truss underneath the vacuum chambers. That way the top truss would be in compression, the bottom truss would be in tension, and I'm not sure what sort of forces on the vacuum chambers, probably somewhat neutral. Uh, to figure that out, you'd have to run a finite element analysis, and yeah, it's not, it's not worth doing the thing strong enough. It's, it, now it's plenty deep, and that bottom truss is gonna be real good in tension. That section of the frame is now overbuilt. Here's a rendering of the frame with floorboards. Floorboards were initially mild steel painted black, and I did that to save material costs the first year. A little bit of a mistake because I ended up building it twice and buying stainless steel. That first year, it was still a little bouncy in the middle, like a weak trampoline. It's because the wheelbase is 20 feet long. That's a big distance to span between the axles. Basically, the rear truss wasn't sufficiently robust in the middle where it connected to the vacuum chamber. There wasn't enough depth once the structure left the vacuum chamber. Save it for this by adding an arc from the rear of the truss to the top of the vacuum chamber, along with some cross members. The thing was still a little bouncy. You could see the arcs in it bend towards each other when you jumped up and down in the middle of it. You know, they go womp, 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 just a little bit. This final bit of flexiness was remedied by adding that horizontal member up top, which connected the middle of the two arcs. Suddenly, this, the entire structure was just ultra stiff, like you jump up and down on the middle of it now. There's no flexing going on. The fusion chamber ends up being a stressed member, but it's 20 inches in diameter, and 20 inch diameter tube is very strong, even when it's got all these ports cut into it. That pretty much sums up the story of the fabrication of Mr. Fusion's frame. No animals were harmed in the making of this video, although at least one human received permanent brain damage. Always remember the number one rule, do not chang it up. Thank you in advance for your cooperation.